I am so excited today to be having this conversation with legendary biblical scholar, Dr. John Dominic Crossan. And if you happen to be someone who is not familiar with him, I want to share a little bit about his background. So Dr. John Dominic Crossan, known as Dom to his friends, is an Irish American biblical scholar with a two-year postdoctoral diploma, with two-year postdoctoral diplomas in exegesis from Rome's Pontifical Biblical Institute and in archaeology from Jerusalem's Ecole Biblique. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Dom? Yeah, Ecole Biblique. Okay, okay, that'll pass, yeah. He's been a mendicant friar and a Catholic priest, a co-chair of the Jesus Seminar, and a president of the Society of Biblical Literature. His focus, whether it's in scholarly or popular writing, of which he has many, has been on the historical Jesus as the norm and criteria for the entire Christian Bible. His reconstructed Jesus incarnates nonviolent resistance to the Romanization of his Jewish homeland and a future hope of a transformed world and transfigured earth. Dr. Crossan's method is to situate biblical texts within the reconstructed matrix of their own genre and purpose for their own time and place so that we can hear them accurately for then before accepting or rejecting them for now. Dom, thank you so much for joining us today. It is a pleasure. Great to be with you, Mike. Yeah, we, we have a lot to talk about. And what I want to focus on, I mean, you have such a wide body of work, but I want to focus on the themes of my favorite book of yours, God and Empire, Jesus Against Rome, Then and Now, which also gets touched on in your more recent Render unto Caesar the struggle over Christ and culture. And I find that you give people of faith an excellent introduction to what might be for them a daunting topic, engaging biblical narratives and history in a powerful reframe. Yeah. So let's dive into it. <laughs> in, in this book, God and Empire, you frequently speak of the violent normalcy of civilization. What are civilization's features and why is this violence normal? Well, it's simply the fact that when our species, we're called Homo sapiens, which I think is a magn magnificent contradiction, the, the wise Homo, when our species came out of Africa 70,000 to 100,000 years ago, we kind of launched a three pronged war on ourselves, on all other species and on our environment, the, the world. And I think what we've been doing ever since is a kind of a cost accounting for that onslaught. That's what we did. I, I'm not blaming anyone, I'm simply describing what happened. But the result is today that we are not on the Titanic, we, our species, is the iceberg. Mm -hmm. So we have to reckon with this. It's the normalcy of things. So the two figures I have behind me, good old Caesar, the Augustus, the Sebastus on this screen to the left has the whole world in his right hand and he's conquered it. On his left, he has the scepter, the spear of conquest. And you see Jesus on the other side with the three fingers and the two fingers separated has only a book. And the book's not open, by the way. <laughs> he, he's not reading it. He is the norm of the book. He doesn't have to read it. We have to read it about him. So these, in a way, are the tectonic plates of, of human history. This is our choice. And it seems to me that's the way it is. Whether we like it or not, we can't get away from it. And we can't get away from it by focusing just on Caesar, and saying it has to be that way, or even on Jesus and saying it will be that way. Maybe. But that's up. Was. Hmm. I already have so many questions, including <laughs> when this three-pronged war began, but I want to I want to start with a good building from what you just shared. In God and Empire, you ask a provocative question that might be surprising to even many lifelong Christians. And here it is. You say, imagine this question. There was a human being in the first century who was called divine, son of God, God and even God from God, whose titles were Lord, Redeemer, Liberator, and Savior of the world. Who was that person? Most people who know the Western world, traditions 
would probably answer, unless alerted by the questions to obviousness, Jesus of Nazareth, of course. Yeah. And most Christians probably think these titles were originally created and uniquely applied to Christ. But before Jesus ever existed, all those terms belonged to Caesar Augustus. To proclaim them of Jesus the Christ was thereby to deny them of Caesar the Augustus. Christians were not simply using ordinary titles applied to all sorts of people at the time, or even extraordinary titles applied to special people in the East. They were taking the identity of the Roman emperor and making it, giving it to a Jewish peasant. Either that was a peculiar joke and a very low lampoon, or it was what the Romans called majestus, and we call high treason. So you point out that it's impossible to understand the Roman Empire fairly, neither condoning it nor demonizing it without understanding what you call Roman imperial theology. Can you say a little bit more about why these kinds of terms were originated with Caesar and what this meant? Yeah, and keep your eyes on my two figures behind me. Yeah, in my, in my own experience, I went to a classical boarding school in Ireland, not, not an elite school at all, a necessity of being in small towns in Donegal, which couldn't have their own high school. So you had one central boarding school and everyone went to it unless you were from that town and you were a day boy. All right. So I had five years of Greek and five years of Latin. So I got into Virgil and all that stuff before I ever got into the New Testament, which protected me. I didn't know it at the time, of course, from thinking, wow, I'm reading this stuff in the New Testament. There's nothing like it. It must be. I had the other stuff first. Now, I didn't know when I was doing it at 11. You know, mm -hmm. I, didn't know. I was just worrying about parsing the declensions and conjugations and not getting hit with the cane and all that stuff. But I was protected. So here's the thing. In that first century world, now, please leave Jesus out for the moment. It was understood that any human being, I'm talking about a human being, you know, you stick a pin and then they go out, who had done something of extraordinary value for the human race, at least as we see it. So Caesar, for example, Octavian at the time had brought victory to the Roman Empire after 20 years of savage civil war. Imagine if ours had gone on for 20 years, not four. Mm. He brought peace to it. Now, to be cynical, you'd say, yeah, he brought peace for it. To a civil war. Let's not, let's not say that. He brought peace to the earth, they would have said. And they said, thank God. But well, wait a minute. We're really thinking Octavian. Well, if he's not a god, what do we need them for? Hmm. I mean, it, it's perfectly logical. He has brought peace to the Roman Empire. And of course, he's going to live. This is from 30 BC to 14 for the next, what's that, 40 years. If he died on the battlefield, <laughs> all bets are off or if Anthony had won at the Battle of Axiom. But, you know, here he is. He's brought peace to the Roman Empire. That, in their understanding, elevated him to the rank of God. So when he died, he would be taken up. He would die, by the way, of course. He'd be taken up among the gods. That was the wallpaper of the Mediterranean world. So if your job description was something... Um, <laughs> if you brought wine <laughs> to, to the human race... <laughs> That would worth getting yourself divinized. Of Praise course. Bacchus, yeah. <laughs> of course. If, if somebody had invented beer and they knew who it was in the first century, that person would have been divinized. They call it apotheosis, to be taken up among the gods, mm -hmm. because of major service to the human race mm -hmm. and thereby manifesting the goodness of the gods, the power of the gods. Now, not everyone could get that title, but it was possible, it was understood, that's the framework of the first Mediterranean world. If we say, oh, we, we just give them a Nobel Prize for peace or something, fine, that's our problem. That's their language, their understanding. So when they tell me that Caesar is divine and all those marvelous titles, I look at the history, I see what they're seeing. Now, I might be impressed by it. I might say, you didn't bring peace, you just brought a lull for maybe 100 years or something. So, what we're up against then is when you have all the same titles used about Jesus. Now, forget 2,000 years of Christianity. Try and imagine an open-minded, I really mean open-minded, first century Roman pagan who believes that people can be taken up to God or the gods. It's in all the stories. And he's hearing Paul saying, Jesus is divine, son of God, 
He's not going to say like we might, eh, we, we, we don't believe that stuff. He might say, I don't believe it about your Jesus. I believe it of my Caesar. Mm-hmm. And then he's already in trouble because Paul's going to say, okay, what's Caesar done for you? Well, he's brought peace. How, how is your life doing? Well, I'm just making it from the, so this great big Roman peace, what's it doing for you? Now, let me give you an alternative. There's this Jesus. And off he's going. He's in there pitching. Hmm. He's using the language that everyone knows. At the end, I might say, I don't believe a word of it. I'm, I'm with Caesar. Fine. Fine. Mm-hmm. But you're pitching in the ballpark. <laughs> you're not talking about weird stuff, sons of God and redeemers of the world and saviors of the earth. That's the language of the first century. Mm-hmm. It's like, you're, you know, if you're <laughs> supposing somebody in America said, I, I, go, I, don't, I want to be president. But I don't like presiding. That sounds bossy. I want to be, I want to be the facilitator in chief. You know. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a foreign syntax. Oh yeah, you just killed yourself with that word. <laughs> so that's their language. Now, the challenge is there though. Make no mistake. How does Caesar save the world? How does Jesus save the world? That's the challenge. Mm-hmm. Right. They're very different ways. So if I'm hearing you you know, apotheosis, this kind of, um, you know, divine promotion is is common, uh, you know, at least in the Roman world, perhaps Jewish folks would have been a little bit more persnickety, or, or maybe I'm even reading well, backwards into that. Let me be careful about that, because the main one, say, the Romans would know about before you get to the Caesars is Romulus. Obviously, he was the founder of the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. He was taken up among the gods when he died and reappeared to people. Now, the equivalent was said, not in the Bible. Remember in the Bible, Moses dies, but the Bible says, no one knows where he was buried. Ah, there's there's the, the chink in the armor. So right. Josephus and Philo both say, our founder, Moses, like Romulus, they don't say like Romulus, was taken up to God, of course, not the gods. So we have Romulus, and Moses both taken up to the gods. And of course, Elijah was right. up there. He walked with God and was not. <laughs> right. So, yeah. yes, it was, I'm going to say it was the wallpaper of the Roman world, of the Mediterranean, as it were, that a human being who had done something of ineffable, precious value for the human race and thereby demonstrated divinity could be taken up at death. Mm-hmm. And even though Moses had been buried, you know, well, there's no, no problem coming out of the tomb. If gods could do whatever they want, and so could God. So that's the what I call the matrix. And by matrix, I simply mean what everyone took for granted. That's mm-hmm. all I mean by matrix. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And even how in later Hebrew tradition, Elijah becomes the, the angel Metatron. And there's this idea of two powers in heaven even within, you know, maybe pre-rabbinical Judaism. Exactly. And Enoch is up there too. So, you know, it's not exactly (laughs) crowded. Yeah, Enoch rather. Yeah, with Metatron. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's it's a very populated heavens in a way that our sort of retrospective, philosophically refined monotheism that tries to like wipe out all the competition in some ways, maybe that finds its ultimate distillation in the Quran, uh, it's a little foreign to us to kind of inhabit that first century world. It, it, it is, Mike. And, you know, when C.S. Lewis made that famous statement that I uh, summarize it, Jesus says he's divine, but he's either right or he's nuts. It doesn't quite work if somebody else is saying it at the same time, because then then you can't work out by logic. You have to work out by faith. I'm committing my faith to Caesar. And it was faith Yeah, to commit to Caesar. Or I'm committing it to Jesus. It's it's not logic won't get you there. You have to make a choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. C.S. Lewis's lunatic liar and Lord is a bit anachronistic, right. and it's more like if Jesus is Lord, Caesar is not. Yeah, and what you know, it all always bothered me about that that challenge. C.S. Lewis had the same type of classical education that I had because I had it in Ireland left over by the British Empire. <laughs> you know, it wasn't that we Irish were into Greek and Latin, but the education I got in 
in the 40s was the leftover British imperial education for running an empire. So he had the same education. He knew about Caesar. Come on. So Lodgy won't get you there. Yeah, yeah. How how interesting that that omission of his, given that he was right on point with many other things regarding, you know, the sort of pagan and Christian. Oh, yeah. Yes. It's always surprised me that he kind of got lured into that argument, maybe. <laughs> and I kind of wonder if it was like a one off that he did, but like evangelicals in particular really latched onto it. It's like probably his more, you know, you know a quip like that you all make a one liner that you're really rather pleased with after you make it, but you know, don't push it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, so you continue, you know, in, in the, in the pages of um, God and Empire for saying that with these titles applying to Caesar by the logic of empire, they in a way make more sense than being applied to Jesus. Yeah. You say these titles were fully appropriate for someone who saved the world from war and established peace on earth. And that the first Christians, therefore, had to present a positive counter mantra and a positive counter program to Roman imperial theology's sequence of religion, war, victory, and peace. Yeah. Uh, because victory just, you know, doesn't bring peace, but only brings a lull. And after each lull, the violence required for the next victory escalates. And so you ask, is there any possible alternative to first victory, then peace? And you say, yes, it is religion, nonviolence, justice, and peace, or more succinctly, first justice, then peace, or peace through justice. Can you say more about that? Yeah, I can, because I'm trying to be very fair. I, I have no intention of trying to caricature Caesar. <laughs> then, it's, then it's a cheap triumph. I mean, if you try to imagine the situation, 2nd of September, 31 BCE, 20 years of Roman civil war is off and on, off again, on again, but it went on for about 20 years. You finally have peace. Anthony and Cleopatra fled to Egypt and suicide and legend. He's, he's the last man standing. I mean, if you're cynical, you could say, yeah, he's, he's killed all the others, but you know, he's the last man. So, he, they would claim the mantra is religion, as you said, religion, you, you get to respect the gods. Then with the gods on your side, you go to war. With the gods on your side in war, you get victory, of course. That's why on that world there, there would originally have been a bronze statue of victory holding a wreath and pointing not towards us, but towards Caesar. In fact, I've seen it on the website of the Hermitage Museum. Sometime they had put it back on there for a while, because obviously it's too precious, was melted down centuries ago. So it's, it's victory over the world, but got by force, of course, and violent. And, you know, somebody like Caesar would have said, like, duh, how else do you ever get victory? We, we didn't invent this, he might say, if he used my language. It's the normalcy of civilization. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, uh, you know, the Persians, the Medes, the Greeks, we, we just got really good at it. We're better than anyone else, but we didn't invent it. And that's the extraordinary thing that somebody could even say, even suggest there might be an alternative. Hmm. Even to suggest it sounds like, oh, wait a minute. So you have to figure Jesus is coming out of a equally powerful tradition, the Jewish tradition, which has always been positioned on the Levantine coast, the homeland, which is unfortunately the high road of empire. So for, for almost a thousand years, any empire in Mesopotamia against Egypt, they're coming right through the Levantine coast through Israel. Yeah. It's location, location, location. And the extraordinary thing in the biblical tradition, that they don't say, well, someday we'll have an empire. The Phoenicians had one, maybe we... No, they said, this is not right for the whole world. This is not the way it should be. And it didn't say just for us. They, they could easily have said, well, someday God will take care of us. Heck with everyone else. What they said was, this is not the right way. There is an alternative could imagine beating swords into plowshares 
spears in the pruning hooks. They could, they could imagine the anvil chorus, as it were. That's the extraordinary thing, really. Yeah. And Jesus makes no sense, absolutely, except for that tradition behind him. Otherwise, I think he'd have opened his mouth and everyone would have started laughing. <laughs> this is really funny. <laughs> it's a joke. Not in the Jewish tradition. Yeah. So behind the Roman tradition, you have something going as far back as, I don't know, the Mesopotamian plains, maybe. You know, This is the way of the world, the normalcy of civilization. And then from the Jewish tradition, you have an alternative. It's in the Torah. <laughs> when God says in Leviticus, the land belongs to me. You're all, you're all tenant farmers and resident aliens. <laughs> so these two magnificent traditions hmm. are, as I said, like tectonic plates below history. They're grinding against one another. Hmm. And of course, it explains why you're wait, holding your breath for Jesus, because it's not a joke. And the only question is whether Antipas of Galilee or Pilate of Judea are going to execute this person. Because mm -hmm. he's not just a philosopher suggesting ideas, he's an activist. And that's what we have to really face. Rome did not crucify philosophers. Mm -hmm. it, it really didn't. Even you know, people who kind of mocked their whole idea of empire and everything else, like the cynics, they just boot them out of Rome every now and then if they got fed up with them. But you, you don't crucify philosophers. Activists are something else. Mm. By an activist, I mean not a violent revolutionary. That's what the legions were for. Rome knew exactly how to handle them. But a non-violent one, who Rome would describe as creating turmoil among the people. That's their phrase for what we would call a, an activist, a nonviolent activist. They're stirring up the people, the Romans would say. Yeah. I want to I want to spend time with each of these tectonic plates in turn. Okay. And and first, I want to, you know, go back to the sort of Roman um narrative, there the great Roman tradition of uh yeah, of peace through victory. And, and then the counter program that we see in scripture's most subversive ideas in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament alike. And what I appreciate about your book, God and Empire, is you go deeper in your analysis than many progressive and even radical people of faith do today, wondering if even empire, whether it's Roman or American, is but the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. You, you give us a glimpse of what one of my favorite like early 20th century esoteric teachers, the, the Greek and Armenian mystic G.I. Gurdjieff calls the terror of the situation, which is our sort of full existential appraisal and weighing of just what it is we're facing before we even attempt to possibly alter it. It's like just taking in the full observation. And, and what I take from your thesis is that our struggle might not be so vast and existential as what fundamentalist religions claim that our human nature is simply irretrievably bad or violent, but you still place the problem as significantly broader in scope than maybe a liberal assessment that this is all empire's fault as such, or even this is all capitalism's fault as yeah. such. You, you seem to suggest that our obstacle to human flourishing along the way of Jesus and this venerable Hebrew tradition isn't merely empire and capitalism as ubiquitous as these phenomena are, but are the civilization project itself. And, and you pose some questions in God and Empire that I would love to hear you take some time responding to here. And so these are, these are quotes from you. The first question concerns empire and civilization. Are all empires past and present but deeper manifestations of what we call civilization. Since its invention of, along the irrigated floodplains of great rivers like the Tigris and Euphrates, has civilization always been inherently imperial and is escalatory violence, but civilization's drug of choice and is it an addiction we cannot overcome or even control? Yeah. I think that's hugely important in, in a way behind behind these lo the local history that we do on the Mesopotamian plains or the Levantine coast or the, 
the Mediterranean basin, the specter I see behind it is civilization itself. And I think of the Roman Empire as no more and no less, no more and no less than civilization, first century, Mediterranean style in a toga. <laughs> no more, no less. I'm not, I don't mean, oh, it's not important. It's just the abstraction of, no. But small history, our local history, not to use, is only part of cosmic history. And by cosmic history, I mean evolution. I mean human evolution within cosmic evolution, within the universe. That's the big history. Yeah. And it, it makes no sense if we just stuck it and say, well, the real problem was the Roman Empire. See, it was, it was pagan. Now, along comes Constantine. We got a Christian Roman Empire. We're home free. <laughs> right. But, you know, I understand if you've been persecuted in the year 250 and along comes Constantine, you might feel a great sigh of relief that the kingdom of God has finally arrived, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, over there in Constantinople. Awesome. I understand it. Yeah. I do understand it. But <laughs> understanding doesn't explain. So in that book, I talk about the normalcy of civilization is not the inevitability of human nature. Mm -hmm. It just isn't, no. factually. Otherwise, we couldn't have people like Jesus who are willing in witness, in witness, to tell Pilate, okay, your kingdom is here in force. Look at your soldiers all around me, as it were. My kingdom ain't here. It doesn't come from here. That's why my guys won't come in to get me out. Mm -hmm. Nobody will attack. This is a parable. I don't think um, Jesus and Pilate ever, ever had a conversation in Latin or whatever. But it's a magnificent parable in John's gospel that sums up the whole thing. Mm -hmm. The difference, Pilate, Jesus says, is you operate by force. And I won't even operate by force to get me out of here. Okay, that's a witness. So it confronts this very visibly for me where I can see it. All of these empires are manifestations of something, to use words where it's far more deeply interfused, I think some word he says. Um, let me back up really all the way back, if you will, to chapter four of Genesis, chapter four. And I would ask, Everyone, just to read chapter four, forget about the garden, the garden, whatever. Leave the garden out. <laughs> read chapter four. It's the first time sin is mentioned, of course. Cain kills Abel, as we all know. The, 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 sh the farmer kills the shepherd, mm. builds the first city. Now, that's about as subtle as a <laughs> kick in the pants. The farmer kills the, that's the agricultural revolution the Neolithic revolution in three words, farmer, herder, shepherd, city. But then keep reading. It's the genealogy of Cain, the genealogy of Cain that um, invents tents and livestock at lyres and pipes. Uh, Tubal Cain in, invents bronze and iron tools. All of civilization in chapter four is invented by the descendants of Cain. The violent farmer. Ooh, that's scary. And then at the last lines, of course, of chapter four, thank God, are Adam goes back, starts all over again, and produces Seth. And then they call upon God. Okay. So I cannot imagine, and I'm being as literal as I can, chapter four of Genesis is the most magnificent summary of the success and price tag of the Neolithic revolution. And it's already there that early in Genesis. Hmm. So I, I, I'm not saying, well, these people all just talk about empire, but I'm so smart. I'm talking about civilization. They smelt something back there burning as it were, behind all these local conflagrations. There's yeah. something else going back there. And I would put it this way, I do in the book, we're not dealing with an original sin, our species. We're dealing with an original state. We are a social species. We all know that. But we have individual wills. 
Now, what other social species, successful like the termites or the, or the ants or the bees, have individual wills? And is that any way to run a hive? <laughs> you know, what if, so we have this terrible dichotomy. It's our nature that we are social and individual and they pull against one another and they can tear us apart. They are our challenge and it's an evolutionary challenge. Absolutely. And, you know, if I might humbly push back a little bit, I think you are smart to bring in the question of civilization itself and this friction between uh, Neolithic and Paleolithic, because when you assert, I think correctly, that, hey, this is not an inherent problem in our human nature, we actually have the capacity for so much more. I think you stand on solid research about how our species functioned for hundreds of thousands of years during the Paleolithic era. You know, as evolutionary biologist David Sloan Wilson suggests, contra to Dawkins and the selfish gene, we are largely a pro-social species. And the way that we organized ourselves for years in band culture, in immediate return forager culture, what folks colloquially refer to as hunter-gatherers, was a more pro-social structure yeah. uh, that was inherently egalitarian, that inherently respected all the sexes and did not have social stratification, where, as you point out in your book, power is something that can be temporarily given based on organic merit in banned cultures, but is fluid and it, it goes from person to person, unlike in civilization, where we begin to have more reified power over. And it's not to be romanticizing the past, it's not to say that we were incapable of violence in the past, but as I think you quip in the book, uh, you know, we were always capable of violence, but civilization made it a fine art and an efficiency that became yeah. more and more baked into who we were. And I, I kind of see an, an ancestral gospel, as um, I believe one of your uh, Irish Catholic, uh, you know, colleagues, uh, Dearmund or Mershu would put it, that we have this ancestral grace that is like deep in our DNA. And, and I think that the Hebrew tradition and Jesus really e exemplify the possibilities of our, our pro-social latent abilities and our pro-social future. Yeah, otherwise we'd be a doomed species. You know, we, we couldn't do anything about it. We would, but we absolutely, everything points to the fact that we can, from anthropology, as you just brought up, from, from our own genetic past, from the experience of the great traditions in world religions, yes. Now the question is whether we will do it yeah. And I do not have, I'm not hopeless. Let me be very clear about that. But neither am I romantic or delusional that inevitably. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have, you know, a choice point. And at this point, I think it's not a hardware problem. I, I it's not our, our bad human nature that's a problem, but it is a software problem. And it is a hey, habit That's a nice way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a software problem. Yeah. yeah. And it's a habit problem because now we do at this point have about 6,000 years, give or take, of the, of the civilizational habit in us that does reward antisocial behavior, sociopathic behavior. And it you know, becomes a, a meme, a philosophy of survival of the fittest, of social Darwinism that you know, isn't in our nature. It makes us miserable, but we do seem to be addicted to it, don't we? Yep. It, it has become the normal. See, that's what we've taken for granted. The, I mean, to be honest with you, I got into the whole anthropology and even evolution through Genesis. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to, starting to think, well, oh, people keep talking about, you know, the Bible is 6,000 years old. Somebody said, okay, okay, if it was just 6,000 years old, that means we started off with the industrial, or not the industrial, sorry, the agricultural, paleolithic, uh, neolithic. I keep forgetting, Ireland never had a Paleolithic, by the way. It, was, it had a mile high ice sheet on top of it. So, so we did, it really off. didn't get thrown in the Paleo. We, yeah. I, we barely made the mess. So the Neolithic, we arrived. Anyway, I, I think we have all this evidence, textually too, in the Bible, that they knew this. It's not that they really thought the only problem was the this the series of the Babylonian. The book of Daniel began to say, wait a minute, there's a pattern going on here. There's too many times the same thing came up. So these are not just beasts. 
They come from the sea. So except they're, they're groping their way towards what's going on out there that produces the, the Assyrian beast, the Babylonian beast, the Median beast, the Persian beast, the Greek. It's the sea. Now, that's a metaphor. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't think it's the sea, but I see them groping their way towards something bigger than this, but incarnated, embodied in what they're experiencing. I think that's a hugely valid understanding. Absolutely. And, and let's, that's, that's a perfect segue because I want to turn our attention now away from the violent normalcy of civilization into that, that great uh, Hebrew counter-narrative tectonic plate, because I do think it preserves the echo of a memory of our Paleolithic past and a different way forward. Uh, you know, you mentioned in God and Empire, and you just alluded to now, that Christianity has officially been agnostic or uninterested in the literal founding age of the earth. Like, it's just not been a thing. Yeah. But at least since the 17th century, some Christians have read the Bible as saying the earth was created around 4000 BCE. And in the book, you give young earth creationists a break. You say, this is actually a plausible way to do the genealogical math supplied by the text. Like Usher wasn't creating this out of nothing. And, and so you ask, you say, granted that some Christians date our universe in the low thousands of years, and that all scientists date it in the low billions of years, why does the Bible itself date creation to around 4000 BCE? Why doesn't it date it at a nice other round number, such as 10,000 or 100,000 years? What's so special about a date of 6,000 years ago? And you continue to answer, you begin answering the question by saying, these authors had no intention about writing about the origin of the world, about which they knew nothing, but about the meaning of the world, about which they thought they knew a lot, and they did. So, so tell us, Dom, why start the story here? Why does the beginning of the world as they knew it seem to coincide with the dawn of complex agriculture and the birth of civilization? And, you know, obviously we all know nowhere does the Bible say it began 6,000 years ago. You get that by adding it all up. But it does say, it does talk about the Tigris and the Euphrates, whatever about the other two rivers. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a place. <laughs> yep. The Tigris and the Euphrates are Mesopotamia between those two rivers. So it asks you to go back to a place and to begin as it were. Wait a minute. We talk about the dawn of civilization. We talk about the cradle of civilization. And those we locate on the Mesopotamian plains between 10,000 BCE and about 6,000. In, in the the, the fertile crescent, you know, the foothills there that you can you can see today. You can even go there today and see it. That's where it that's where it happened in this tradition. Now, other ones we can leave aside for the moment. Yeah. This is where it wants to start its story. Yeah. I think that's that's actually profoundly right. We are still living in the agricultural revolution. Yes. Um, think of it. The farmer kills the shepherd and builds the first city. And the city is very busy now taking care of the farmer. <laughs> Another defunct. <laughs> the farmer has no future. And we're talking about the individual farmer. I, I would think yeah. huge business will take over. So already they knew that something had happened. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're taking it. I mean, the Mesopotamians talk about the shepherd god and the farmer god though they thought they made peace together. So all of this stuff is there already. We're not reading into it. Now, if I'm talking about somebody who, who cannot accept human evolution, I could say, well, we can't talk. I'd say, well, no, if it started 6,000 years ago for you, how do you think it's going? Mm -hmm. How is it doing? Yeah. Um, let's, let's start, yeah, okay, I'll say whatever you want to say about chapters one, two, and three. When you get to chapter four, <laughs> which is very fast for you, it's right the, the second moment of civilization. Yeah. How do you read chapter four? Yeah. And how, how do you think we're doing? Rather than say, well, if you're if you don't want to talk about cosmic evolution, uh, well, I'm not going to talk to you. Mm -hmm. I think it's too serious. Yeah. 
because we're dealing with our the future of our species. Absolutely. But we want to have as many allies as possible. That's right. See, okay, we will we will disagree on this. Yeah. I, and I won't let on, I'm agreeing with you, but I could bracket this for the moment yeah. in order to think, what can we do? Now, yeah. if somebody says, well, I don't care really about the earth because I'm planning to leave it and go off to heaven, that's in a way where the conversation would end for me. Right, right. Book ended by a bad creation narrative and a bad eschatology that does right. tend then to... You, then you could say, in, in, yeah. in the same way as I can't, do much of an argument with a sociopath or somebody who says, look, I'm going to be gone, so why should I care? Mm -hmm. I, I, all I could say is, well, we came out of the Garden of Eden yeah. with the knowledge of good and evil. That's called for me conscience. So I think the knowledge of good and evil is what tells me this is not right. Mm -hmm. This is not right. I, I get that from that tree, as it were, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's a um, unfortunate talking past each other that I think contemporary, you know, conservatives and progressives do, contemporary, you know, fundamentalists and atheists, where they, they disagree about the details, but they agree about the premise of the game. And so yeah. they, they, you know, Genesis becomes this battlefield of is it literally and scientifically accurate, which I think is the exact wrong question for me, is it existentially accurate and is it anthropologically accurate yes. i think what so many christians you know reify as the fall is this sense of alienation that what is narrated in the expulsion from the garden and these subsequent episodes that we're alluding to like you know the cain murdering abel is the sense of fourfold alienation from a sense of the sacred from our own selves from our neighbors and from the world itself and that all healthy religion, all pro-social spirituality is attempting a fourfold reconnection between spirit, self, other, and world. And if we had a deep anthropological appreciation of the wisdom of scripture, especially Genesis, I think that even believer and non-believer alike could come around a common appreciation of these really resonant stories and build a better way forward together. You know, I, I think they would, Mike, honestly. Um... You know, the, the, I, I feel such admiration for the, the people who wrote the first stories of Genesis. They, they've told this story of the flood. They've grown up with it. They have no reason to question it. But they're not going to go along with it when they say the gods did this and the gods did that. At the end of the flood, in chapter 9 of Genesis, they're going to make the extraordinary statement that God just about said, I'm sorry. As far as I can see, the only time, God's not big on sorry, by the way. Um, so God says, I'll never do that again. Okay, that's as close as you're going to get to a divine apology. Mm -hmm. And I'll put up the, the, the rainbow to remind me not, not, to, not to try that one again. That's an extraordinary thing. Yeah. Because the deluge story, as you know, in Mesopotamia, well, there's good gods and there's bad gods and, you know, things happen. Um, <laughs> at the end of their story, to say... Never again. That's huge. But yeah. that's them wrestling with their stories. Yeah. I would simply say to our modern Christians, wrestle with your story. Mm -hmm. Your story is, say, out, I mean, the, the, the story that's out there, I mean, by your story. Yeah. Wrestle with cosmic evolution. Yeah. Rest, wrestle with human. Don't give up on it. Yeah. Say it your way, but don't, don't just say, well, it's... <laughs> It's not 14 billion, it's just 4,000. Yeah, come on, that, that, that's too easy. But in the meanwhile, I'm going to say, can we agree on what we have to do about the earth? And can we be very careful in assessing whether our own religion is part of the problem? Our understanding of religion, that's what we also have to ask. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, by the way, if you're someone watching this and you're not quite sure what Dom and I are talking about, about these sort of Sumerian stories around parallel flood stories, or even we haven't talked about this, but the epic of Gilgamesh and the ways that these are in like a vital conversation with uh, with the Hebrew Bible. I really recommend reading God and Empire because Dom, I don't think we have time to talk about it today, but he talks about how the storytellers in Genesis 
riffing on Sumerian creation stories about the changes taking place from the transition from the Paleolithic world to the Neolithic revolution. And how did the Israelite storytellers had a more maybe even skeptical stance on civilization's alleged benefits than some of the Mediterranean source material that they're drawing from, like the, the difference between how farmers and, uh, and and sort of pastoralists, whether or not they actually become friends or whether they kill each other. Um, so read the book, but Dom, do you want to comment on that briefly, just like how there is this vital conversation happening and why um, you know, the Hebrew Bible narrates the beginning of the world as we knew it with this rise of civilization. Yeah, it, it was kind of a shame, you know, when when we first discovered all this, these background stories, like you just mentioned Gilgamesh and all the rest of the Sumerian stories, immediately people said, oh, this proves the Bible is all rubbish, see? So immediately, of course, everyone, that's, they're cool. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're told your stuff is rubbish, you don't say, oh, I never thought about that. You come right back and say it's absolutely true. Yeah, I I found reading that those stories, say the Gilgamesh story, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, reading those stories, and I you know I, I don't know cuneiform, so I I was reading it very much in English, and it's fine. I was enthralled. Yeah, because like I could I can get inside the mind now of somebody who said there's only one God, so there's not good gods and bad gods, but I got this story. Hmm, how do I, how do I think it must have happened if there's only a good God doing it? So I, you can kind of get inside their mind, but you can't do it if you don't, if you don't have all those backgrounds. I'll even mention one tiny book. It's a Canadian book um, by Ronald Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. It's called The Short History of Progress. Yeah. You know, it's about that thin. And it's, it's supremely ironic, <laughs> a short history of progress. But he's not pushing Judaism or Christianity or anything else. I don't even know where he is on that. He just says, let's take a look at progress. Yeah. And he takes you back, you know, and starts with all of these stories. It's, it's a magnificently easy read, and it's a great book for a group. I, I was talking about this one time in Canada in the lecture, and somebody said, have you read this book? And I said, no. And they, they gave it to me before I left. Now, usually, you know, if you get a book, you kind of say, okay, one more book to carry home. Right. I started reading it in the plane on the way home. Wow. It's, it's the best simple summary, simple in the best sense of the word, for what we're talking about, as a, to give you all the background you need to know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a wonderful one. And uh, I, want, I want to pivot to Jesus now, because you, you spent a, a lot of time in God and Empire, and of course, in your entire scholarly career, on Jesus, and I, your, you and your friend and colleague, the late Marcus Ford, characterized Jesus' ministry as being marked by a kind of magic that's manifest in the miracle and the meal. And in my own work, influenced by you, as well as Bruce Chilton, I see Jesus as centering conviviality as the centerpiece of his approach to the kingdom of God, this kind of social reversal where life becomes a party and kind of a meal sharing celebration. And it strikes me, I'm curious what you think about this, that many of Jesus' values that he attributes to his heavenly Abba are immediate return forager values. You know, he teaches things like take no thought for tomorrow. Don't worry about what you eat or drink. Consider the lilies of the field. Let's be, let's be here now. Let's be present. And, you know, in the parable of the rich man building bigger barns to hoard his grain surplus, yeah. he's called a fool who won't live to spend it all. Whereas today he'd be invited on like the conservative Christian talk show host, Dave Ramsey, to talk about godly investment strategies. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you agree that Jesus was a man out of time in some ways, even then, with a way of receiving spirit himself, others in his world in a way that's more congruent with a paleolithic cosmovision. I would have no problem with that, except that I am so immersed myself in the biblical Jewish tradition that I see the continuity more striking there. Yeah. For example, when the people who looked at John the Baptist, mm -hmm. Jesus' mentor, and Jesus, I disliked them both, said that John... John feasts, John fasts, and Jesus feasts. Yes. Now, they, they call them names, you're know, and all, but forget the names. 
I think John the Baptist is saying we we fast for something which is coming soon, but we feast for something which is already here. Mm -hmm. So John is Im imagining God is coming to do it for us. That's almost like in the biblical tradition and in the, uh, the Jewish tradition in general, from the time of almost 150 years before the time of Jesus, it's almost like uh, one empire after another, they keep coming. And now we have the Romans coming east. Now well, we thought the Greeks were awful, but now you have the Romans. It's almost like hopeless. It's almost like we give up. God's going to have to come and clean up the mess. It's like, it's your world, God, clean it up. We can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, that's not what Jesus says. I think Jesus says, and I see it coming out of the Jewish tradition, the land belongs to me. You're all tenant farmers and resident aliens. Then we have to share the land. Okay. Now, under the Romanization of the Jewish homeland, sharing land, <laughs> forget it. If you can share food, you're doing good right. and healing. So when I think of Jesus sharing food, I don't see it as sort of generosity or um, hospitality. I see it as a plea for justice, not charity. No, not, 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 not charity. Because right. you don't get crucified for charity. You get canonized. You get canonized for charity. You get crucified for insisting on justice. You really do are assassinated. Yeah. The Romans said, we handle justice. First you get peace, then you get justice, and we decide what's just. So first of all, think of eating. Eating, healing, and teaching. That's what Jesus is the business. Now, healing. I, I, there used to be a time when I found it difficult to convince students that healing was a political act. Hmm. They said, well, it's, it's kind of magic. It's mind over matter. You persuade people they're healed. Now, I don't think in America, in 2024, there's anyone who doesn't know that healing and who's in control of healing and how you get healing is very, very, very political. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus is healing people, and you, you can understand that any way you want, I consider Jesus had to be a great healer or we wouldn't be talking about him. Yeah. And when I read stories like he raised the dead, I'm not the least bit surprised. I don't think he did it, hmm. honestly. Hmm. But if you were a great healer in the first century, or Aesculapius before him, of course he raised the dead. Hmm. That's your department of public relations speaking, not your department of medical records. <laughs> you know, so Jesus is healing. So who controls healing? Who controls eating? Who controls teaching? Yeah, Rome. Yeah. Oh, are, are they political? I think we know as we get ready for the next election. Yes. Mm -hmm. Teaching and what you teach can be highly political. Yeah. Healing and who you heal and how you heal is intensely. And eating with whom you eat and the right to share food, all of that, none of it is nice, polite stuff. It's all political, intensely. And that's yeah. That's what Jesus is embedded in. So it's not a surprise. Well, it is a surprise he lasted so long, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I think Jesus is protected in Galilee by the fact that Antipas had executed John mm -hmm. and he was smart enough not to get rid of another popular prophet for X number of years. Right. So I think Jesus had a, <laughs> a certain period of time when he could get away with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, you go up to Judea and all bets are off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that you're emphasizing the continuity with the Hebrew tradition. And I didn't mean to suggest by saying that Jesus has a paleolithic oh. cosmovision that he's sort of skipping over that period and oh. kind of just dropping in out of nowhere. But I think you pointed to it when, he, when you're even discussing the differences, perhaps, between John the Baptist's approach and Jesus' approach. John the Baptist, in some ways, to me, exemplifies that that Hebrew tradition of prophetic waiting, longing, and yearning, whereas mm -hmm. Jesus seems to exemplify a kind of radical imminence and a right nowness that when I read ethnographies of even like, you know, more surviving indigenous cultures today, and even when I spend time amongst contemporary 
permaculture communities and eco villages, there's very much a sense of right now is the most vital and alive thing. And it's where we're creating the abundance of, of right now. And I'm imagining that even though Jesus is in continuity with this great tradition yeah. that he made first century, uh, you know, down on their left Jewish folks uneasy. He certainly made first century Romans uneasy with the way that he brought these elements forward of, of taking no thought for tomorrow and, and really giving it our all. And so I'm wondering, yeah, if it, yeah go ahead. I was going, I was just think, I think we really have to be bilingual. Mm -hmm. Because I find myself speaking to people who are in the tradition and, you know, no problem with language like kingdom of God, all of this stuff. But then if I'm talking about people who've said, I, I, I can't stand any of the theism stuff or, you know, I will switch the language. And then I will talk anthropology, Paleolithic, Neolithic, not because I think it's false. I think, you know, it's the tradition fits in a wider matrix and the ultimate matrix is human is cosmic evolution not even human evolution mm -hmm. I, in one sense i wish darwin hadn't come first it would be much better i think for our understanding if we kind of discovered cosmic evolution mm. and got cool with that before anyone said oh, we're descended from apes and have you lost your cool <laughs> you know, <laughs> right we said, well you know the universe is like this and then we kind of narrowed it down to say well that's weak you know, but you know, that's that's just fake. So I, I think we should be bilingual. I am absolutely at home in my own tradition. Mm -hmm. I really am. I've I've no embarrassment with the language, even when it's kind of dated. You know, I I'm not big on sheep and shepherds and all the rest of it, you know. But I understand it, so I can be at home with it. It's yeah. not but then there's this wider matrix, it's not another matrix, really. It really yeah. is really a wider one. And you can shift into that. And that's where all of the Paleolithic experience, the Mesolithic, the Neolithic, everything we've gone through yeah. and can know about becomes absolutely valid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in one sense, it's bilingual, but almost as if your second language is somehow inside the first language. Yeah. There. And yeah. then you could, that's for Christianity. Judaism must be doing the same thing. And I think Islam has to do the same thing. It has to say, how does our vision fit inside this other vision because evolution really doesn't care whether you believe in it or not mm -hmm. it really doesn't mm -hmm. and neither does gravity by the way <laughs> right <laughs> if you don't believe in gravity gravity doesn't get annoyed so yeah. i i don't see these languages you know as being in in conflict with one another mm -hmm. i i just try to figure which audience is going to more respond more to kind of the anthropological evolutionary yes yeah yeah it's a, it's a great question of, of appropriate language and uh you know I, I find personally even as someone who is a lifelong christian who grew up in a sort of fundamentalist pentecostal and evangelical yeah. background that that having learning these languages of of you know anthropology and our own sort of cultural evolution as a species as well as like the wider cosmic story, the new universe story, as people like Brian Swim and Mary Evelyn Tucker and others talk about, actually redignifies my Christianity and helps me to share it without embarrassment, whether it's with my fellow believers or whether it's with folks who are ex-Christians or never were, because I can talk about the existential and anthropological wisdom of these texts and of the teaching of, of Jesus I'll never forget once I was talking to a, a friend who, you know, didn't have a Christian background and she was just like, will you tell me more about Jesus? Like just the way you talk about him is really compelling. And I thought if only my evangelical past self could hear this situation, this was the dream of evangelism that I was raised with that people would say, can you tell me about Jesus? But our culture doesn't do that because, you know, we have had such a narrow Christians have had such a narrow cosmovision and we talk about Jesus and God and, and the, the work of sacred history in a way that's so tired, and so overplayed, and seems to have so little to do with our condition, our existential condition. And I think putting it in the, the bilingual dialogue with science, with anthropology, with evolution, just makes it all way more alive. That, that's where the conversation is, is most fruitful. I worked a lot, as you said, with my friend and colleague, 
Marcus Bohr, but we, we were both in the same <laughs> the same matrix, actually. You know, we're talking to ourselves in a way. It, it's far better if you have somebody who is, wants to talk about science and maybe couldn't give, give a hoot about Christianity. Okay. <laughs> then you have a real bilingual conversation and it's very powerful because I think that's what we... We have to have it's it's the same it's the only one world. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Dom, I want to be sensitive to our time here today. I, you know, I wanted to talk some about apocalypse, eschatology, and evolution, but you know, if we're if we're running low on time, the great news is you know you're about to be uh, leading a class with our friend Trip Fuller that's going to be exploring a lot of these dimensions, and it's called the historical Jesus the evolutionary challenge of a Mediterranean Jewish peasant. And it's a Lenten class that's being offered. Pay what you can afford, including nothing, uh, because, you know, you and Tripp really want everyone to have access to this material. I'm just wondering if you can share a bit of a preview of what will be explored in this course. Um, let me talk about the medium before I get to the message. Absolutely. <laughs> Since 2000, um, Sarah and I, Marcus and Marianne Borg, were leading 40 people around Turkey, mm -hmm. mostly, uh, every year in pursuit of Paul, <laughs> in the footsteps of Paul. We came back, Sarah and I, with gigabytes, almost <laughs> half a terabyte of images from all of that. Wow. So when I lecture now, it's not so much a lecture with illustrations, it's illustrations with a lecture. So I have about 40 images I want to show wow. and then I comment on them. So that's the way Tripp and I have been working for Christmas and Easter. Like if, if we were on now, I would hit share screen and go to the image and I would talk about it. So when we talked about, um, say, Cain and Abel, we'd be, I'd be using images that we had got over there. Um, so it's visual. It's, it's trying to talk about visual lectures. It's, it, I try to invent something new, yeah. not more lectures with a few pictures, but visual lectures, wow. because most people learn better visually and orally at the same time. That's and that's the way most people got their information in the past, visually in any case. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're doing. Now we're going to look at the world, basically the world of Jesus and going to ask the question that you know, know how do you get peace? How do you get cosmic peace? Well, you kind of know, <laughs> you look at the images up there. So we look at that, but then we look at what we have left from that world, the Battle of Axiom, for example, the altar of Augustine peace in Rome, the great Augustaeum celebration at Aphrodisias. We look at where we can see the world of Jesus, not just where he went, but where can we see the imperial world of Jesus visually. Then the second, second one will be on the life and vision of Jesus. And the big question there is, how did Jesus's tradition get traction in Galilee? Traction. That means your tradition hits a moment when people are ready for it. I mean, they've heard the prophets have been going on about this for 500 years and the Torah says, talks about how to run a just world. Okay, what did Jesus have? Besides parables, <laughs> traction. Why was this moment ready for Jesus? Okay. Then the third one, why did Jesus go to Jerusalem and what happened that Passover? If he went regularly, what happened this time that had never happened before? If you think he only went this time, leaving out Luke, Luke's account at 12, why did he go? Was he invited to bring his message to the capital city as if somebody said, hey, get out of those hick towns in Galilee. If you're serious about this message, bring it up here. Let's have a demonstration in the middle of Passover. <laughs> We can protect you. Did Jesus go up to Jerusalem to get martyred as a demonstration? Well, let's watch what he did. Not reading his mind, but watching what he did. And then the final thing, the resurrection of Jesus. And here is where I have something which is crucially important. Western Christianity has a totally different vision of resurrection from Eastern Christianity. Mm. And if you don't know that and you're in the West and you're talking about resurrection, it's kind of like you're talking English and you think everyone else does too. Yeah. 
Western Christianity, Jesus comes out from the tomb, glorious, triumphant, magnificent, but very much alone. Eastern Christianity, Jesus is shown coming out with Adam and Eve. Mm. Adam and Eve is the whole human race. Mm. Now, so the last lecture is going to be, how on earth, how are we supposed to imagine that? Can we take that literally? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, what does it mean to be included in resurrection? What is Jesus, the of resurrection rather than yeah, all these mean? debates? on the forensics of resurrection. Yeah, rather than I don't believe it. What, what claim are they making then, in their own language then, put bluntly, what did resurrection mean in the first century before you find out what it means today? And the people who used it thought it would be an eternal meaning. So it's not like I'm groping for meaning, making it up. Most of these people thought they were making claims that had eternal validity. Okay, that's like if you're reading Plato, he didn't think he was talking to the Athenians, just he thought he was talking to all time. Okay, let's judge him. We do it with philosophers all the time because they are claiming something about human nature. So we take, okay, let's see what he's talking. He was talking to the Athenians or Heidegger to the Germans. Let's see if there's something valid to say about we should be doing it to Jesus too <laughs> or, or Moses or anyone else. So that's the whole series, visual ones on the life, the world, life, death. I, I, I want to say execution. I, I'm trying not to say crucifixion because we've kind of got used to that. Yeah. Jesus was executed yeah. legally, yeah. formally, publicly. Not too many founders of great religions were executed, not assassinated or not lynched or something else, but officially executed so we have to face that what was jesus doing or saying it was Pilate just having a bad day or something so that's kind of what the whole thing is about it it's very much question based and visually answered if you will yeah what i what i've really appreciated about your work over the years dom i mean i first discovered your work in undergrad when I was still very much had a foot in evangelicalism and in fundamentalism. <laughs> At the time, you know, I found some of your assertions around what might be crudely called demythologizing to be unsettling to my to my worldview. But even then, what I appreciated was that even if I said, well, I don't agree with them about everything. And even to this day as, you know, somewhat mystically inclined post-Pentecostal, I might bring more credence to the possibility of physical healing than you do. Yeah. But, but regardless, the, the questions you raise, your, your attention to historical detail, to meticulousness, and your, you know, ability to inhabit these early worlds and ask, what, what did these terms like resurrection mean to the hearers? Even then, I found that it was, you know, hard to reduce what you were saying to a caricature even though many of my co-religionists would have wanted you to, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. wanted me to reduce them. And so, you know, when, when you're bringing all this rich material, I think that regardless of whether someone watching this is coming from a more conservative and evangelical background, or maybe you're even like a nihilist flirting with atheism, but, but when you're Christian, you still inhabit that worldview. I think there's a lot here to challenge um, those assumptions. And to, it sounds like what you're saying is you're looking at at Jesus and his movement almost as like the forensics of a social movement. And what did it take for it to gain this other form of power, power with rather than power over? And maybe how can we capture that essence and that spirit of Jesus for today? And that's exciting to me. Could could I look at a postscript about healing? Yeah. When I, when I was a priest, I went one, once, only once in 1960 as a chaplain with 40 people to Lourdes. Lourdes, as you know, is a healing shrine. We went to Fatima first and then Lourdes. Um, it was a healing shrines of the Virgin Mary. And you see a lot of crutches there. And also from Ireland, Aer Lingus had almost like a flight plan straight from Dublin Airport to Lourdes, taking people from parishes all the time. People would go to Lourdes. Now, people would go on stretchers, really. I never saw anyone walk home I'm not being cynical, I'm being descriptive. Absolutely. But I never saw anyone coming home that wasn't feeling magnificently healed. Mm. Mm. Now, 
I never saw anyone cured. Mm. I, I, yeah. There's a lot of stretchers, uh, not stretchers, uh, uh, signs of healing at Lourdes. But all I'm saying is uh, healing and curing ain't the same thing. Sure, sure. And we know that from ordinary language. We talk that the healing begin. So I think Jesus healed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I don't think he cured. For example, just to show you where I am. Yeah. If somebody had their eyes gouged out in a battle and somebody didn't die, which they probably would have, but let's say they didn't. Yeah. And they came up to Jesus and he put his hand on them. Would they get their eyesight back? No, I don't think so. Would they be healed? Yes, because he would take them into his community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in my own experience, that's what I saw in the night processions at Lourdes. Yeah. People came and the whole place was, you know, lit with candles and people were in stretchers. I never saw anyone getting out of a stretcher. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden you're in a world of healing. Mm -hmm. I, I would be absolutely certain. And maybe what it does with stress and everything else, I know that people went back and say they were healed. Yeah, yeah, that's valid. The distinction. I didn't see any coffins. I'm not being cynical. Yeah, but no, if you I... have to describe lures in a commercial message, you could say, <laughs> "Come in coffin, walk home." You know, <laughs> that's public relations. It's hyperbole, <laughs> but it's hyperbole based on a reality, which I consider, I would call healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if if we know now. <laughs> America needs healing very badly. Mm -hmm. Curing, I don't know, but but healing. So, yeah. you know, it's it's a different understanding of what words mean. And if somebody wants to figure that Jesus figures that anyone anything could happen, that's fine. But that makes it then no longer something I, I can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If Jesus could create healing in the sense of making community that absorbs people who can't see and therefore can't keep a job, can't hear, can't see, can't hear, can't walk, can't get pregnant. There's the same stuff in Lourdes and Fatima. Same stuff in Aesculapius, there's healing shrines and in Pergamum and Kos. And I've seen them. So, okay, that's something we could do. Great healing. That's something we're supposed to be doing. Now, the other stuff, oh, that's fine. I can't do that. So good for Jesus. <laughs> You know, that, then we're home free. It, it, it's a great game. We give all the literal stuff to Jesus, and then we get off home free and doing anything ourselves. Because we can't do that. I, right. I, can't, I can't multiply loaves and fishes. Could yeah, there be so a better way of doing it? <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, no, I hear that. And growing up Pentecostal, certainly witnessed parallel things. You know, many altar calls, many prayers for healing. And, and many people who, you know, would go home disappointed. And, and in some ways, it was probably because there was maybe more so than in Lourdes, there was a fundamentalist assertion that it had to be a cure or it wasn't cure. valid and that yeah. your faith was deficient if you oh, weren't cured. That's the terrible thing. That's the double. It's your fault then. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is, I was terribly aware of the danger of that at Lourdes. You went there, you, you weren't cured. Clearly, your, your faith was inadequate. So now you come home double crushed. And that's what I was trying to figure. Why don't people come home double crushed? Because they did tend to hear that preaching before they went. If your faith is powerful enough, you'll be, and they usually said cured. Yeah. But I, I wasn't seeing it with people coming back. And that's what I couldn't figure out. This is before I went there myself, just in the parish. You know, there's every year there was pilgrimages to Lourdes. And I could never sense, why aren't these people crushed? Mm. Double crushed with bad theology. Right. I think they let it go right over their head, but the experience was more powerful than the theology, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it was, pastorally irresponsible to have that teaching of, yeah, your faith is deficient if you don't walk away with a cure. And I, and I think, you know, where we might still defer, and I'm completely fine with it, is I do think that sometimes there have been things where people are are cured of of certain ailments in certain situations that defy statistics and and maybe it's the very hope that that can happen that does have people continue to go back to those sorts of situations yeah. but yeah. I, I agree with you that you know if the emphasis is on a more holistic healing it's a lower barrier to entry and it's something that we can all 
sink our teeth into when we're figuring out how to build loving, inclusive community and not let uh, ailment stand in the way. And I think that some of our, our chronically ill and disabled siblings are really leading the way in, in helping us to like reformulate bad theologies of, of curing that end up being really alienating and harmful to a lot of people. And, and that's, that's really why I have a difficulty with, as I say, with fundamentalism. Right? I mean, I could say, well, you, people believe whatever they want. Why should I care? I want to know what it's doing to people. Yeah. If, if it's telling them that all you have to do is believe the unbelievable, that lets us off the hook too easy. That's, that's, yeah. that's kind of baptism becomes a lobotomy. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. and that's, yeah. It, it ends up perpetuating the alienation that healthy religion is supposed to, to overcome. Instead of, instead of being the work that reconnects, as Joanna Macy would put it, it just becomes, yeah, like you said, believing six impossible things before breakfast. And, yes. uh, and, and do, you, you, do you score true or false on this metaphysics quiz? And what worldly good is that? So, you know, what I love is that your work in general and this upcoming class with Trip, you're talking about like how, how to put flesh on these bones if you want to be a faithful follower of Jesus in the 21st century. What does that mean? How can that be informed by our historical reflection and our evolutionary trajectory? Thank you. Yeah. It's going to be the series. <laughs> yeah. And you can go to crossandclass.com <laughs> and you can uh, you know check it out. And Dom, thank you. This has been a treat. I hope that we can, you know, do some more of these kinds of conversations because there's just so much that we could cover. Yeah, I, I would love to. In, basically, you invite me, I'm here. <laughs> Simple as that. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you.